hands all over this room. Our posture is surrender this morning, and we just say, come and have your way. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen.
that identity back on the Father. I don't know who that is, but we just decree that that identity is being broken off of your mindset this morning. And we just decree over your life, I hear the Lord saying, you can trust me with your future. You can trust, come on, you can trust me with your future, the Lord's saying. So can we just again lift our hands and we just say, God, we give you our future. We give you our future, and we just decree that we will trust you with our future. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, can we just give Jesus a shout of praise this morning? He's so faithful, he's so good, and he's so holy. Hey, hey. So I'll raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies And I'll raise a hallelujah hey. Louder than the unbelief hey. And I'll raise a hallelujah Cause my weapon is a melody I'll raise a hallelujah 
from now, you're going to be talking about the last four days. How many of you believe that? Raise your hand. It isn't just the healings and the salvations for which we give God all the glory. I believe that fellowship has been forged. 
I think that men and women of God who have served the Lord, maybe isolated, are now realizing we're a part of a great army. You know, it, it really does refresh you. The Bible says that God refreshed me by sending Timothy. The friendships and the links and the fellowship of friends that are forged in revival last a lifetime. And let me tell you, you need friends. How many of you need friends? Raise your hand. And I have a saying about a friend. A friend will stab you in the front. Somebody, you know, you got that immediately, didn't you? And uh, we need that. Iron sharpens iron. And I know I've been tough on some of you. I admit it. I've been tough on you. But the ministry today is under an assault that it has never been under. And I'll tell you how bad the attack on ministry is. It's the only one that is predicted in the Bible. Meaning, the Bible went out of its way to say it would be tough to be a pastor in the last days. Now when you read the owner's manual and it tells you that, it's sobering. Demons are activated because the devil knows his time is short. But their world is falling apart. Ours is coming together. Once again, clap for Catherine Mullins and this wonderful worship team. Aren't they the best? They're the best. Hallelujah. This morning I'm preaching a message entitled, You and Your House. You and Your House. And if you look around you right now, it's a Wednesday morning in the religious Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And the power of the Lord is present. This is a very wonderful turnout. I think we ought to give God the glory. I think we're in revival. I think we're in revival. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Last night I told you that it was possible that President Trump might have been watching because I got it from an inside source. He has a rule that uh, if an audience can, if you can guarantee him an audience of 5,000, he'll come and speak. Well, I tell you what, I want him to come so that the fire of God will hit him. That's what I want. How many of you know, he's already got the boldness, he just needs the fire of God. Today I want to talk to you about Hamas, Israel, the economy, the uh, puppet president. I'm just trying so hard to get the approval of Facebook this morning. <laughs> You and your house, look at me please. One of the earliest speeches that was ever given by Abraham Lincoln had this in it. At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Before I read any more, the leading headline of this hour is America may experience a terrorist attack. Billions of dollars are leaving Citibank and Wells Fargo and other institute, Morgan Stanley. All this money is leaving because they believe a crash is coming and that banks can't be trusted. Now, we're at the point where we can't drink the water, eat the food, drive on the freeway, or go shopping without major weapons. In California, what we've done is legalized insanity. Our the governor of California is so open-minded, his brains have fallen out. I worked on that. 
I did better with you than in front of the mirror. <laughs> so the statement is, and a, a prophet that I trust said that an attack similar to what Hamas did in Israel is going to happen in the United States. So the danger is supposedly coming from the outside. Keep that in mind. By what means shall we fortify against the danger? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth, our own accepted in their military chest with a Bonaparte for a commander, shall not by force take a drink from the Ohio or track a make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reaches, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be the author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must survive throughout all time or die by suicide. One day, Joshua stood in front of the people and said something that I don't know that you've ever really understand. I didn't see it. It's in, uh, it's in this verse right here, Joshua 24, verse 14. That's where I'll begin reading. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you shall serve, whether the gods which are your fathers, that your fathers served, that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites on whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Somebody said amen. It's very difficult for me to answer the question of where is the approach of danger because it's not coming from where you think. I live in a little town in Tennessee. I moved from the Bay Area of San Francisco to Tennessee, a small town. In, uh, in the town where I live, the housewives own shotguns. In California, they go and get their nails done. In Lafayette, Tennessee, they own shotguns, and they know how to use them. So if Hamas wants to try something, don't try that in a small town. You, you need to help me right now. Does anybody know what I'm saying? You're going to go after their kids? They probably skinned a deer. And you're coming in with that towel on your head thinking you're going to get something done. I'm going to... Amen, brother. How many of you have noticed that I've adjusted to the local culture? <laughs> Say it out loud. As for me, As for me and my house, and my house we will serve the Lord. All safety in the last days begins with that phrase. God is concerned about your house. Your house. The danger will come from somewhere else. Those who serve God will be persecuted by those who believe in God but don't serve him. That was the cancer of the modern Christian church. We created the option of knowing God without obeying God, of believing in God without serving God. And it got to the point that because of your being on fire for God, you become an automatic 
conviction to the lukewarm. Am I preaching yet? How many of you have experienced what I'm saying? The first time an usher said, well, in our church, we don't raise our hands. Is when grandma needed to slap the usher. I'm, wait a second. Now. I'm going to preach a little bit. That's when grandma needed to slap the usher. That's how you raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you like it so far? Listen to me. Until you appreciate this part, you're not going to get the good part. No. It became fashionable to leave conviction, discipleship, commitment. And so we invented life support. You know, you walk into a hospital and you see a patient with a tube up their nose and something connected to make them breathe. And there are all these machines attached to the patient because they are not capable of doing any of those life functions on their own. That's modern church. The sermon is putting a tube up somebody's nose. They can't pray on their own, so we got to give them life support. And so we have turned from a mechanism to create soldiers for God. It was the will of God for you to be strong enough to stand on your own. Amen. It was the will of God for you not to backslide every week so that you hear another sermon about how God's going to forgive you and he doesn't even care about that. So we made people weak. Here's what we have a name for it. I looked it up. And I googled it. It's called child abuse. Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. We believed that the mediocre should guide the church because we felt it would bring in outsiders. What we were wrong to do is to take away the impetus and the mechanism, the engine that drives your church is the core that's on fire for God. I'm going to try it again. The engine that drives your church is the core that is on fire for God. Now, if you want an ultimate weapon, you, it is a youth group that's on fire for God. I'm going to try that. Yeah. Joshua's decision to serve the Lord was this. He said, you may think it is evil to serve the Lord. That's what's wrong. We believe that it is right to believe in God, but it is evil to serve Him. Wow. Wow. Just like we've come to believe that husbands ought not to have authority in their house. So the chain of command has been broken. Boy, I better look for an exit right now. I'm going to get purses thrown at me. See, and, I, and understand this. The women's rights movement in America has proven not only to be a catastrophic implosion and failure because it has made women miserable, but it proved that women were just a bus stop on the way to a real agenda. Was to destroy the definition of man and woman. And you notice this? We have young girls that have to swim against men. Somebody help me with that. They have to play, they train all of their lives to be good at a sport only to be defeated by a man. And it is defended as some sort of enlightenment. And it's funny how it doesn't go the other way. No trans, quote, men or women that think they're men are going into men's sports. It's only going one way. And what kind of a coward are you?
Have you ever wondered where the national organization of women are on the subject? Women are being battered, women are being defeated, women's dreams are being dashed and destroyed. Then they've got teachers undermining their authority as a mother. So what is the answer? The answer is to set up your house as a Holy Ghost nuclear reactor. Hallelujah, I feel it right now. Let me tell you about me and my house. Let's go with that. Me and my house, you're going to serve the new Christian God. You're going to serve the new God that he loves you and he forgives you even before you repent and you even offend him. Even though the owner's manual said they would turn grace into licentiousness. And they would say that gain was the same as godliness. So the fact of the matter is, and this remains to be understood, that you today, to have safety, have got to understand the threat is not coming from overseas. The threat is coming from the lukewarm, carnal Christian and the unbiblical preacher in the United States. They are the threat. They are the threat. Matthew Henry said that a false preacher is a traitor in the camp and he's worse than a thousand enemies outside the camp. There's a preacher in Atlanta and I don't want to impugn him by mentioning his name so I will only use his initials which are Andy Stanley. Oh, oh. What was that, Mario? I would tell you that was an accident, but none of you would believe it. What an embarrassment he is to his father. What an embarrassment he is to his father. And he's being deliberately used to bend young minds. Because the, the, the overwhelming abundance of his congregation is young married couples. that are being told the Bible has flaws in it. Now let me tell you something, there, there's several forms, that's called gargling with gunpowder and then shooting your mouth off, you know? <laughs> I mean, I've been living in Tennessee too long, yeah, I, <laughs> Wow, where did that come from? I remember the day my wife said to me, we're going to have chickens. <laughs> Boy, my California brain just started. I mean, my idea of hunting is to go to the meat section of Costco. <laughs> Your house is where revival begins. The four walls of your house are where this comes. And you've got to establish this first. The first point of this message is, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we understand where the threat to that decision is going to come from, is the lukewarm Christian. That's where it's going to come from. Makes you feel like a fool because you pray out loud. Makes you feel stupid because you love Jesus. Because your marriage, you're respecting your wife, you're respecting your husband. You're living a godly, orderly life. And let me tell you about the United States of America. We are technological giants in the body of a moral midget. We can put a man on the moon, but we can't love our neighbor. We don't know how to stop lying. And when it becomes unfashionable to tell the truth, look at the world I'm in. I was in, I'm, I love the certain age that I'm at, which is none of your business. I told you that was the year I was born. Well, I want to tell you something. I was with a pastor, and uh, many, my best friends are pastors. My, 
people that I know that I love the most are those that are serving God and attempting to build a church according to the word of God and the faith of God. And they've got to get past the lie that that doesn't work. Look at this morning. Look at this tent. Look at the numbers of people that are getting saved. This is a slap in the face to the idea that you hide the gospel, that you don't let the Spirit of God move. See, how many of you understand? We are getting back to original Pentecost right here. Original Pentecost. That's it. So he said, me and my house. And it is interesting that he's talking to Jews and saying some of you have decided to serve the gods of Egypt, even though you saw Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. You're still subject and believing. And we look at that and say, oh, that's stupid. How could they have been so stupid? How is that any different than a Christian pastor who believes he can get drunk? He's serving the God of Egypt. I'm going over here. Help me so much. He's serving the God of Egypt. Coarse humor. Dishonest handling of funds. I believe that men of God should be prospered. Men and women of God should have more than enough. They should be able to be out of debt so they can be a blessing to someone else. And that's the key, is to keep prosperity connected to not how much you have, but how much you give. Amen. That's where it stays pure. The Bible says by righteousness a house is built. And by wisdom its rooms are filled with treasure. So stand, stand in the name of Jesus, not right now. Make your stand to make your house a sanctified place where the presence of God is there. Every once in a while, it's good to scare your neighbors. It's good, once in a while, walk out, stand in front of your front door, and just start yelling. And say, devil! You're not coming in this door. You're not going to have my child. They're not going to be on drugs. They're not going to be perverted. That stuff is not coming in here. This is the bloodline right here, devil. Outside there's chaos. In here there's peace. Psalm 91, verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. We're going to move this to the fact that the Bible talks about homes in many interesting ways. It said, better is a house with love and peace than a palace with strife. Some of us may not be all that proud of our house. But you've got to understand what God thinks of your house. Whether it is small or whether it is massive is irrelevant. Amen. What matters is that you've said, I am going to officially say something to the outside world. Me and my house. Now listen to this. The man of God should be praying with the children. Amen. I'm going to say it again. The man of God should be praying with the children. The example, the tone that is set, the man has his role, the wife has her role, and hers is very powerful. 
Don't ever underestimate that. And there are single people here, so we're going to have this distinction. That especially when you're not married, you need to turn where you sleep and where you live into a place that radiates with the peace and the joy of the Lord. You know, so what's not going to come nigh your house? Loneliness. Help me, somebody. You know, I want to tell you about the Holy Spirit. Because I've, I've really, this person of the Holy Spirit that I've spent my life being taught by and listening to. There is a thing about the Holy Spirit that is very difficult for me to understand because he has a passion and a power. He wants to heal, but he doesn't. He wants to move, but he doesn't. And it is interesting dynamic. In times where I feel the frustration, I said, Lord, I know you love people. I know you love the sick. I know you want to move. What is going on? There are two tensions that drive the Holy Spirit. One is the passion to heal and save. And second, the refusal to compromise truth. Now, how does that apply to a single woman? You want a husband, but you don't want an idiot. I'm going to try this side over here right now. I'm not saying you want an ugly man. You don't necessarily want a man that you could push his face in dough and make monster cookies. No. You know what's weird is some of you are laughing hard, others are writing as fast as they can. But there is, in the single person, this dynamic. I want to get married, but not to the wrong person. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Amen. Not to the wrong person. So you can have a very, a passion about wanting it and a passion about being selective. Yes. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I want to move, but I won't in a carnal vessel. Because if I empty a wheelchair in the presence of a carnal minister, the audience is going to think that I'm condoning that man's doctrine and imbalance. Do you know that you're going to find this very fascinating? Have you noticed that doctrine is no longer important to Christians? And that someone that brings up the issue of something not being biblical, they're, they're rebuked. I was with a man and he said, why are you calling out falsehood in the church? And I looked at him and said, why are you not? Why are you not? Well, I don't believe in touching God's anointed. I said, listen, you need to stop with that. Because that verse is, is totally abused and misappropriated. It, you know what the best translation of that is? Do not kill my anointed. When it said touch them, it means don't wound them. Don't hit them. Don't kill them. It doesn't mean don't put a post in Facebook where you say you, you really believe there's a jello mountain and cows drive tractors? And this man said, how could you say that about her? How could you say that about her? How do you know that's not true? And they, wanted, they thought I was going to give a profound answer. And I go... Because it's stupid, that's why. I mean, you still love me, do you? Yeah. Because you have made the Lord, <laughs> because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. 
Joshua said, my house will serve the Lord. Psalm 91 takes it to the next level. I'm going to make God my house. I'm going to look at you again. I'm going to make God my house. So I live in God. And the Bible says in Him we live. In Him we breathe. And in Him we have our being. So now only have I taken the four walls of my house and said this will serve God. I now say, God is my house. Yeah. I'm driving down the road, turn on the news, and some idiot is trying to scare me to death. <laughs> We've only got hours left before the monsters show up. The devils are coming. Inflation, disaster, crime, everything. But you are dwelling in God. Yeah. I'm going to try to get you are dwelling in God. Your nervousness is not God's fault, it's your negligence. Your fear of the future is not God's fault, it's your negligence. You have not understood that Psalm 91 has said, because you made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil is going to befall me because I have made God my house. Anybody getting this? Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you is so important, so key and central to the teaching about you and your house, that I'm going to be very careful to articulate this, and it may seem tedious to some of you, but in order for you to get it, when you watch Fox News, when you watch CNN, and you realize that the way they sell product is they glaze your eyes over with fear. You can't believe what we found out today. Godzilla is coming. According to our map, oceanography map, he's approximately 150 miles off the coast of New York. And by keeping you paralyzed in fear, psychiatrists have invented a term for what's going on with Americans staring at devices all day long. It's called video neurosis. Look at me. I wish I'd have put that in the notes. Video neurosis, meaning that if enough news is coming into you, you see, it's inadvertently your video game so when you look at your teenage son and said how can you spend all those hours playing that video game it's not real and you come away traumatized if you ever pull a teenager off some moment where they're engaged in battle against some three-headed thing you will find rage rage because that world is so real to them. But you're doing the same thing. You're playing a video game. Hello, I'm your news commentator tonight with what's wrong with everything. One more night of what's wrong with everything. And then you start talking to each other. Do you realize what's wrong? You have any idea what's wrong? This is going on. One time. I was reading about the NSA and all the information they have on me. And I called my spiritual dad, Ralph Wilkerson. And I said, Dad, they've got my social security number. They got my cell phone number. They got my address. They've got it all. He said, son, what is wrong with you? The devil had that all the time. If the devil knows my social security number, what do I care what Obama knows about me? Because Obama needs to know this. I'm a blood-bought son of God. You touch God's anointed.
when I started on Flashpoint, I went on there and began to do political commentary because God told me to. Then at a certain point, I noticed in the Christian conservative movement that they began to depart from the word of God. You say, Mara, now you really got silence. You don't dare take an offering right now. <laughs> but I want you to understand my concern. We began to identify with people who are genuine patriots and conservatives, but they are not born again. And so we began to form inadvertent alliances because we agreed on agenda and we agreed on policy. But God began to tell me, he said, look, I told you to come out against this politician because of what he was doing to the country. I told you to come out against him because the church was being lied to by him. Then at a certain point, God said, I want to remind you no politician is going to save the United States of America. No election is going to save the United States of America. What's going to save America is a moral awakening, an outpouring of the spirit. So I can fight abortion, and, it, and I'm right to fight it, and vote against it, and speak out against it. But if I want to get rid of abortion, I need to have the Holy Spirit put a love in women for their children. <laughs> Mario, you don't know what's going on. There's a laboratory here. There is a sleeper cell over there. There's something under that rock. And then we didn't leave it alone. We decided to see demons everywhere. You got a devil. I went to a church one time and there was a lady that had a weight problem. I'll be very careful how I say this. And the pastor said, every guest speaker that we've had has cast the devil out of this woman. And I said, and it just keeps coming back? I said, I was a young preacher, I didn't know any better. And I, I said, what's going on? Well, she gets delivered, and then it comes back. And she gets delivered, and then it comes back. So now we're playing Dungeons and Dragons in church. You know, I'm waiting on ha Harry Potter to come out of the vestibule. And I look, and I, so I, they brought her to me, and they said, it's your turn to cast the devil out of her. This is the 57th deliverance she has gone through. I said the wrong thing. So instead of saying what I should have said, I said this. Come out of that devil and leave it alone. I'm going to preach right now. It's time for us to come out of that devil and leave it alone. Paul, Paul said, do not encourage demons to operate. If one comes at you and gets in your way, cast it out. But don't go on a witch hunt. Don't go on a news hunt. Instead, make God your house. What floods my mind? What are we going to fill our mind with? Faith. I'm going to try it again right now. Faith. I'm going to get in the word of God and I'm going to forge my day so that I'm not making the Bible live up to my emotions. I'm making my emotions live up to the word of God. I'm not surrendering my sanity to the whims of news. I'm anchored in the Bible and in the word of God and in the present. Not only do you make your house the house of God, but God becomes your house. So what do you do 
when they say, we're going to take your guns, we're going to pervert your children, the first thing you do is this, don't miss the strategy of Satan, who wants you to get in the ring with him with natural weapons. He wants to use your panic. If you panic and you fear, one of the things that people around me don't understand about me is, Amara, this thing has just happened. It's a great opportunity. Somebody just said they'll do this for us and they'll do that. And uh, we got to seize the moment. And I'll say, I'm going upstairs in the prayer room. No money, no threat, no devil, no opportunity is going to come my way that is more important than the mind of God. To go out in the will of God. Amen. Someone said, well, over here, there's a guy. He's a, you're a 100-watt bulb for Jesus. He's a 25-watt light night, night light. And he's getting all these views. So if you do this message, you'll get all those views. I don't want views. Come on. Come on. You know what? Every preacher needs to be haunted by the white throne judgment of the Bible. It says, and you know, we say, well... We're, gonna, we're saved. We're not going to judgment. What's the matter with you? you? Once again, the word of God says every man and every minister is going to stand before God to give an account of the works, whether they were done in God or done in themselves. Every empire, every corrupt, every corrupt newsletter where you ask for money and didn't put it toward what you think. You know, I knew mainstream ministries that would glom onto an orphanage in Africa and use the money they claim to raise for children to pay the general expenses of their ministry. Right. Look at this man right here. You give me a check and you say, Mara, I want this to go there. I might turn it down because I said, look, I can't be held hostage. I'm not serving your lobbying. You know, you could be a lobbyist in the kingdom of God. You can say, man of God, I believe I, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you'll do this. That doesn't, that doesn't hold any weight with me. Because I'm going to stand before God and say, why did you let somebody bribe you out of my plan? So be, the devil is pacing out in the parking lot right now. He's going, I wish I was as smart as all these people think I am. Oh, the devil made that happened. This, this thing went bad in our church because of the devil. No, you disobeyed God. You hooked up with a ministry you shouldn't have hooked up with. You brought in a speaker and you didn't check out his doctrine or his morals because you wanted the crowd that he supposedly would bring. So instead of using the Holy Spirit to build the church, you're using hirelings. I'm going to amen myself. By the way, it works the other way, too. Because sometimes God will send somebody to your church, and you won't like them. I'm standing there next to a, a pastor, many good pastors, by the way. And let me tell you, this uh, crookedness deal is not limited to any one of the five office gifts. There's plenty to go around. But there are godly men and women, and there are many that are right. In fact... There is an entire generation of young and powerful pastors rising up in America they, that are starting to do it different. But this particular occasion, man is pacing and he says these words. That man will never speak in my church again. Yeah. Said that. So I'm older. I haven't fun. You know, getting old is fun. I, I feel bad for those of you that still worry what people think about you. That's a, there's, isn't that a wonderful feeling, Pastor, when that day comes? Ooh, I'll bet you thought that hurt. And so he, I looked at him and I said, what did you just say? That man will never preach in my church again. I said, did you just say that? 
I said, there's so much, there's so much wrong with that. I don't know where to begin. First of all, what if God sent him? Just because they have a word you don't like or agree with, maybe God sent them. And why are you calling it your church? Did you ask God if he's supposed to be back? So all of a sudden, the value system in the church is totally corrupted. It is not about whether you pray and know God. It's about whether you can draw a crowd. So when bad news comes, what do you do? Look at me. What do you do when bad news comes? First, remember. That's the word. Remember. No calamity strikes the righteous without God first revealing it to his prophets. That's how I know these people that some of you like are a bunch of phonies. None of them saw the pandemic. None of them were warned the church that they were about to be locked down. November 2019, every single prediction of the most popular voices in this country was saying that 2020 was going to be a year of prosperity and growth in the church. And six weeks later, we were locked down. And idiots allowed the government to close their church. Now, God will warn his people. That's why making God your dwelling place is the most important thing. Pastor, let me tell you the most important sermon that you will ever preach to your people is when you get alone with God and you say to your people, your welfare and your safety means more to me than your money or your affection. I'm, let me talk about moms and dads for a moment. You don't want to be your child's friend. You want to be their parent. They say, I hate you. Oh no, my child hates me. Your child doesn't hate you. They say that all the time. I hate you. What they hate is the discipline. That's right. And that's what the parent needs to be the parent. Said, you know what? I, I know you hate me, and uh, I, somehow I'm going to survive. <laughs> is anybody getting anything out of this right now? <laughs> Isaiah 26, verse 20. Come, my people, enter into your chambers, your house, and shut the door behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood. and will no more cover her slain. Video neurosis is condemned in the Bible. In another portion of Isaiah that I neglected to give to my friends, where it says, do not call conspiracy what these people call conspiracy. I know that Alex Jones helped us understand that the frogs were gay. And that bothered me that I might walk across my yard and meet a gay frog. The pink toenails glowed in the dark. That's what bothered me. Now, do not call a conspiracy what this world says is a conspiracy. It is true that the one world money system is coming. 
It is true that the vaccine was wrong. It is true that we were manipulated by Bill Gates and all of the rest. It's true that George Soros is a devil that is using his money to corrupt our nation. No doubt about all that. But having all of that in your spirit and knowing about it to where it becomes the dominant theme of your life is going to derail you. Because while George Soros is doing his thing, you need to understand what your thing is. Your thing is to say, you know what? I'm on this earth for a reason. I'm here for a reason. And I'm going to get with God. So when world events come, pastors, leaders, ministers, we all need to get alone with God to get the God perspective on what the church should do. The power of Isaiah 26 to 20 is that a man of God heard from God that a storm was coming in advance and told the church to hide. And there is that. If something comes to Winston-Salem because of evil, how much more then should that make us pray and make us sensitive to God's voice? How much, when you say, man, do you realize what is coming? And you hear people say it all the time. Do you realize what they're doing to our food? Do you realize what they're doing to our water? Do you realize what they're doing to our money? And you want to go, you want to grab them and say, do you realize what that ought to make you do? That's when I left the political arena and realized that I'm going to support Donald Trump. I'm going to do everything in my power to do tent crusades in the battleground states. Because I think, yes, we are. And so, hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is passed. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn a new phrase. And I want to make it, you to make it your own. You are a catalyst. Look me in the eye. You are a catalyst. And some of you in this room have been gossiped about that you're old. Somebody said, you're old. And you can hear them whispering. I wonder how much longer before we put them in a home. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause a rebellion right here. You're not supposed to go to a home. Look, you already have a home. I'm going to try it again. You're not supposed to be put in a home. And when those greedy family members come after you to put you in a home, fold up your walker and start beating them with it. <laughs> then go in your room and lock the door. Said, I live here. This is my house. This is where God wants me. I need, we need to move our joints a little bit. We need to quit feeling sorry for ourselves. We're not here to gum applesauce and leisure world. We're here to fight devils. I, I did, am I taking too long? Uh, you know, I was at a conference with uh, all the five-fold gifts. All the five-fold gifts. I mean, I couldn't believe how many folds there were. And, and you know, so we're sitting around, one is saying, I'm a bishop, I'm an apostle. You had 50 members. I'm an apostle. And uh, I'm a prophet. I said, yo, just giving yourself titles. So I'm gonna be a knight. I mean, while we're, I mean, isn't that what it's all about? We get to choose, right? I'm a knight. So from now on, you refer to me as Sir Mario. The tongue-talking, fire-breathing knight. I'm gonna get me a white horse. I'm so scared of horses.
Once you know that you're walking with God on a daily basis, you're going to get plenty of warning when to hide and what to do. So you're not going to put energy into dread. You're not going to put that because your mind is focused on this. What am I supposed to do? I'm not here to be afraid of the devil. I'm here to be the devil afraid of me. I'm not going around saying, I wonder what evil is doing. I want evil to say, I wonder what Mario's doing. So here's your new, st this ought to be a t-shirt. Ready? A catalyst, that's not the t-shirt. A catalyst is scientifically defined as any element that changes everything around it without itself undergoing a change. The gospel is a catalyst. Not supposed to be changed by what's around it. It's supposed to change what's around it. You are a catalyst. You're not supposed to be absorbing. There are two, there are two potential temperaments in the last days. Let me give it to you. Catalyst, sponge. One gives off, the other soaks in. One ends up with the color, the flavor, and the odor of their culture. The other gives off the fragrance of Christ and transcends what's going on in the culture. Is that great? Now, the t-shirt would say, the end times are not happening to me. I am happening to the end time. I'm going to try that one again. The end times are not happening to me. I am happening to the end time. Glory to God. In crisis, we will get new advice. All of a sudden, we'll get panic advice. But when that advice, that direction, that prophetic word, that insight, contradicts the word of God and what you already knew to be true, then you can tell it's of the enemy. No matter how seductive, persuasive, or convincing it might be. Listen to this. When you live in the world that we live in, the biggest, the two D's are deception and distraction. The purpose of deception is to get you to move in a direction. The Bible uses the word planeo when it says do not be deceived. It means don't be thrown off course. Now if you're traveling in space and you get one degree off course, you're actually starting into a large circle. And this is why churches go through vicious cycles because they've been thrown off course. Yep. You know when to keep going straight because the devil will tell you there's no money in it. You're going to lose friends if you do that. And if all you're doing is staying with what you were already doing, then you know it's deception and distraction. The purpose of distraction is to make you tired. The enemy of everyone in this room is fatigue. It's Brother Hagen who said, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. People love, when I was young I'd preach multiple times a day, not get much sleep. And I love God so much that it was a pastor, an old-time preacher, who gave me wisdom, said something that he, he said it was really hilarious to me. He said, son, the Holy Ghost will kill you if you let him. <laughs> because he knew I thought what I was doing was the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't. Advice in a time of crisis is to get you to make a panic move based on events that are temporary so that you will give up the eternal for a knee-jerk reaction. Matthew 7, verse 24. 
Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a man who built his house. That's the, this is the name of this sermon, you and your house. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew against that on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock verse 26 but everyone who hears the sayings of mine stop look me in the eye this is not a sinner and a saint these are two believers the believer who builds on the rock and the believer that walks away from the demands of Christ and doesn't build on the rock. Ironically, this verse ties directly into another one that refers to the church. On this rock, I will build my church. Literally, the first wise man who built his house on a rock was Jesus. Man, when I practiced that, I thought everybody was going to throw chairs in the air. I was looking for thunderous applause. I got, didn't even get a gentle spring rain. I'm just joking with you. The first wise man who built his house on a rock was Jesus. Amen. And you know what? When the devil says the church doesn't have money, when the devil says the church isn't growing, when the devil says the church isn't going to make it, it's because of the house that was built on sand. The house that's built on the rock will say we're out of money, we're not growing, we're in crisis, but we aren't building this, Jesus is. I'm going to try it again right there. We're not building this, Jesus is. Do the sayings of Jesus. T.L. Osborne was on TBN one time and they asked him, why don't we see miracles in churches? His answer was so simple and childlike and so profound that it haunted me for many, many years. He said, it is because we do not quote Jesus. We preach about him, we elucidate about him, but we don't quote him in church. If we were merely to quote the sayings of Christ. So Jesus said, whoever hears my teaching and does it will be like a man who built his house on a rock. That's how you build your business. That's how you build your family. That's how you build your life. You begin by understanding, I am not on this earth. Look at me. Look at me. Imagine a soldier in a foxhole in a, in a forward position. The enemy is shooting at him. He feels alone. He feels like the whole world is against him. But then, if he remembers, I belong to an army. I belong to an army. And this army is not any like any army. Norman Storman Schwarzkopf was the leader of Desert Storm. And they said he was going to give a speech to several hundred thousand soldiers that were standing at attention. So I got up early, because in my time, it was on TV live like 4 o'clock in the morning. I got up to hear him speak. And I couldn't believe what he said. Several hundred thousand military people there about to go to war. And he says this. You have the best weapons in the world. That's how he started. So man, I'm, I'm biting toast listening to this. He said, you have a strategy that was planned and devised by the most intelligent military experts 
in the world. So now we got the best weapons and the best plan. He didn't stop there. You have received the most advanced training available to any soldier on earth. So now we got the best weapon, the best plan, and we've gotten the best training. Then he said something that hit me. He said, you are the best soldiers that America has ever known. And whether they were or not, I was ready to go. I almost threw a brick through my television. I was standing there going, man, this is something. Now I'm going to look at you right now. We are not on this earth as a cruel joke. Look at me. Your church, your family, your business, your education, your life. God didn't leave us on the earth. We are not a lonely soldier in a foxhole. I looked at it and I thought to myself, Norman Schwarzkopf knew how to motivate and instill confidence in the soldiers. Our general is Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to run around this tent right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first duty of a general is to remove his army from certain annihilation. The greatest proof that we can get our country back, the greatest proof that we can see revival, the greatest proof that this thing can turn around is the fact that we are physically still on the earth. He hasn't taken us out. Why hasn't he taken us out? Why hasn't he come to take us out? Because we can still win. We can still win. you raise your hands right now and start praying in the language of the Holy Spirit and I want you to leave every drop of fear and discouragement and confusion right here at this all this entire tent this entire tent right now is an altar you don't need to come forward where you're standing is an altar and I want the fire of God to burn out your fear, your confusion, and your doubt. I want the fire of God to burn out every last bit of fear and doubt in the name of Jesus. Pray louder. Pray, pray louder right now. There's a controversy in your church. Pray it out. There's a fear in your heart. Pray it out. There's a confusion and a yawning question. Pray it out. What is my future hold? I have the best general in the world. I have the best weapons in the world. I have the best strategy in the world.
ore bete de di oroto yara de be sendere di oroto katara bari ondololo koso People are receiving the Holy Spirit right now. People that needed the baptism, all you have to do is go to Jesus, love on Him. The healing of your body, the finances in your life, the threats on your children, they're all gonna be, all gonna be a bonfire. We got a bonfire going right now. And in that bonfire, we're throwing in everything, every weight, every lie, every news headline, everything. We're throwing it in there. And we're coming out of this full of the fire and the glory and the anointing of Jesus. Ota bike rindolo boria rabasai. Thank you. As you're praying right now, confess that your body is healed. Tell, tell your body what the Word of God says. Tell your body right now. You're going to line up. It says that your Word is life to your bones and to all your flesh. Iko Right now, all fear dies, all discouragement dies, all confusion dies. The Lord is telling you right now, right where you're standing, you almost gave up on your vision, you almost gave up on your dream, you almost allowed current events to overrule what I told you I was going to do with you. But right now, I say, I am going to use you and every, there is no plan B. There's only plan A. Yeah. Hallelujah. Everybody look at me for a moment. I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to you about your healing in your body. I needed a healing. And it becomes very important for an evangelist who prays for the sick to get healing himself. Otherwise, you can feel like malpractice. <laughs> and it became fashionable because I, I'm, in, I'm a connected to many faith preachers because I believe in faith so much. I believe in love even more, but I believe in faith very strongly. And it was fashionable not to admit that you were sick, that you were somehow doing something evil by admitting you were sick. And I had one of the worst examples of a ruptured disc that you could get. And it put me on my back. And I immediately had to stay in a downstairs bedroom on my back. And the Lord said, tell the people that you have this condition. And I said, Lord, I've learned from some of these faith guys not to ever tell people. Well, there was one recently, a great man of God, who admitted, he said, I should have told you what my family was going through a lot sooner so you could pray for me. But here's what it matters. I'm telling the truth. And when they examined my spine, they said that disc is 75% out. That's why you're in pain. And and I, I don't like pain medication. Don't like how it makes me feel. So I lived with that. And so I was put in a, in a downstairs room. And the first thing I did is I printed out all the verses on healing. Pasted them on the wall. And I confessed every minute. My wife will tell you, I was a fanatic. I wouldn't let doubt get in me for one second. The devil would stand by my bed and said, you're going to be a cripple. You'll never walk again. 
And so I went through all of this and waited and month after month and I, I knew God was gonna to touch me. So then one of the top spine surgeons in America happened to live near where we were, but it would take six months to get to see him, right? And somehow he worked it out where I could go see him. And so I went and got some x-rays and the, the person that was taking, I want you to imagine this, the one that was taking pictures of my back said, I know that you're going to hate this, but I'm going to need you to bend forward. He didn't realize. Oh. I would be, I told him, I said, I could be in such pain that I'll pass out. So you'd be ready. And when I bent over, I mean, it was unbelievable. And he took a picture and it showed the condition, which was important. That was only a few days before my appointment with the surgeon. This was one doctor, and I'm going to another, the chief surgeon, man who teaches how to operate. So I'm standing there fighting discipline, saying God is going to touch me. God is going to touch me. I can't let people in a tent know that I'm not striving to believe God for my help. I can't be a hypocrite. This doctor calls me and he said, I'm gonna see you on this day and I need a fresh set of x-rays. I said, doc, they just took them. They just took, he said, I don't care. I'm gonna get a fresh set of x-rays. I want my own. He didn't realize what he was doing. So I went to him and sat there. And he said, what do you think I'm going to need to do for you? I said, well, something arthroscopic, maybe a one-inch one incision on my back, and then in a few days I'll be better. He said, Mario, that's not how this is. He said, I'm going to need to operate through your abdomen. And 50% chance that you'll be better in six months. But the odds are that it could take a year. And you could be out of what you do for a year. I mean, you talk about sobering. But then he took off his glasses. And he said, look at this x-ray that you got a few days ago. And he said, sir, you have received a miracle. He said, this disc has moved so far back in that it is now within the range of just having physical therapy. Hey, how many of you believe that I went to physical therapy? How many of you believe I was there and became like a trainer in the physical therapy place? It was such a miracle. And there was a, a woman who was a prophetess of God and she called me on the phone when I was in the lowest point and said, I see you dancing on the stage. And I thought to myself, if, the, when, if heaven had windows, would that be possible? But I'm gonna tell you what I learned about healing. Look at me. Many of you have not yet received your healing. And I wanna tell you the secret a secret, not the, a secret. Put your hand in your heart. Say, I am a, a weapon. A weapon. Do you ever realize that? You are a weapon. Now, do you know how militaries rise and fall? On the maintenance of their weapons. Why is America superior? Why is the Israeli army superior? You put your hand down now. Because they don't leave a weapon broken. Look at me. If the engine on the plane needs to be replaced, it'll be replaced. If the, if the rifle is overheating and locking and misfiring, it's going to get fixed. If we have to take it apart, whatever we're going to do, all militaries repair their weapons. 
Now listen to this confession. I'm more dangerous when I'm healthy than when I'm sick. Well, you say, Mara, but Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You got to get that fixed. What he's talking about is humility. When I know I can't do it without God, I'm strong. When I pray before I make a decision, then I'm strong. When I don't allow pride because I don't trust my heart. But he, what did the Bible say? If there are any sick among you, if any weapons are broken among you, Call for the elders because maintenance is due right now. I'm going to try this side over here. Maintenance is due right now. One last story, then I promise I'm done. I told you this guy said he was an apostle, this is a prophet, this guy. And then they were telling me, I tell you, this person, this man right here, he's an intercessor. He's something else. He's from this foreign nation and he, he's prayed and things happen. I said, the devil's not as afraid of him as somebody else. The most dangerous person in church is grandma. I said, there's the average grandma in a spirit-filled church is better than any apostle in Africa. You're not helping me enough. But I tell you, Grandma will pray. And, you know, they talk about mama bears. There's mama bears. There's mama grizzly bears. Then there's Grandma. And you need to tell the devil, I'm not dying anytime soon. I still have grandbabies that are outside that need to come in. I still have children that are knuckleheads and they need to get right. Receive your healing right now. Confess your healing. Confess your healing. Say, by his stripes, I was healed. I'm a weapon. I need a new heart. I need a new pancreas. I need to be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to make uh, an announcement. We're going to receive an offering tonight again. Hallelujah. Two in a row. Glory. And I want you to be prepared to give because we are about to make an announcement. Now, I'm not building up tonight with hype. I'm telling you what God told me. We're at the point where the miracles are not going to bless us. They're going to scare us. And you know what? How many of you know I'm ready for that? I'm ready for that. That's how I get my thrills. My son loves roller coasters. My friend Larry Rutledge, who's here taking pictures and works with us. He loves roller coasters. And they try to get me on them, but I quote the Bible that says, Lo, I am with thee. <laughs> and that's why I quit jogging, too. Because the Bible says the wicked run when no one is chasing them. Where are you going? Be ready and bring people tonight. Come early. Come at 5.30. Join Todd Coconado and myself. We're going to be on this stage doing a live show that will go across the world. And uh, we've been averaging 20,000 people watching the live stream 20,000 people 
The total views, yes, amazing. And it's growing. I think last night went up over 20,000. Believe with me for the power of the Lord to be present and be strong in the Lord. Don't be afraid anymore. Usually I have Frank come up and close in prayer, but I'm going to close in prayer. Then I'm heading out to get ready for our show and to pray for tonight. How many of you have not purchased the book, It's Our Turn Now? You haven't bought one yet. Raise your hand. Say, I repent. <laughs> uh, it's available as you leave. We'll have someone help you with all three of the books. It's Our Turn Now, Vessels of Fire and Glory, and Do Not Leave Quietly. Those books will change your life, and they're at an excellent price. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we dismiss with a conviction that the last days are not happening to us. We are happening to the last days. And we are strong. And as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you tonight. Hold on, Frank has something important to say. Come on, how many received everything today? Come on. Amazing. We will continue to have an outreach at 12 o'clock today. And we will have prayer today at 4. And then today after service, we will pick up chairs. If you can help us, just grab your chair and take it to the back. Uh, we appreciate it. And then tomorrow morning, we'll be taking the tent down at 9 a.m. It'll only take a couple hours. If we can get some help, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. God bless.